Yes, please. All right. We're recording. You're all set. Thank you. Um, okay. Seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling this August 3rd, 2023 meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order at 4.32 p.m. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Um, we are also recording this meeting audio and visually. Uh, with that, I'm gonna take a roll call attendance to make sure that attendees, committee members can hear and be heard. Um, our first two in the roll call, Shalini Baumilne and Pat DeAngelis will be absent today. Um, and so Mandy Johanneke is present, Pam Rooney. I'm here. And Jennifer Taub. Present. And we welcome Jesse Selman and John Thompson today. Jesse, can you hear us? Yes. Excellent. And John, I know we'll check in with you when, when it's time for, for your portion of the meeting, um, but we welcome both of you today. Um, with that, we're going to basically get, get started here. Um, we're starting a little bit out of order for those in the audience. Um, we have a special guest, Jesse, here, um, who is representing well, I, I don't know whether you're here on behalf of ECAC, but you are the ECAC representative for this proposal in front of the council that was referred to CRC, which is the Specialized Opt-in Energy Code. And this is just a discussion item today. So we're going to start with that so that we take the least amount of time with Jesse. We take as little time with him as we can with him because he's kindly joining us. Um, and then we will move on to residential rental bylaw. And if there is any time after that, we will move back to discussion items and the follow up with the joint CRC AMAHT meeting and the rest of our items. Um, we will likely take public comment between the specialized energy code and residential rental bylaw um, so that because today with specialized energy code, our goal today is to collect questions that people have for if we were to adopt it. CRC's role in this is to make a recommendation on whether to adopt the specialized energy code. Um, and so today's purpose of today's portion of that meeting is to collect the questions we would like to see answered before we hold the public hearing, which will be held September 7th during our CRC meeting. Um, so we're not going to be discussing recommendations or anything today. We will do that after the public hearing is held, but we needed a little presentation, a, a short one to talk about what it is and then to get our questions all out there. Um, so that's the point of that today. And so we'll probably take public comment between that so that if there are any comments on the specialized energy code, Jesse can be here for them before we up and let Jesse go back to his, his life and his job <laughs> while we continue our meeting. Um, are there any questions from committee members or anyone about the um, plan for the meeting before we jump right into that specialized energy code? Seeing none, um, Jesse, I know I told you maybe like a couple minutes to talk. I don't know whether you're prepared to just talk about what the specialized energy code is and all of that, similar to what you did at CRC, but not the in-depth presentation. We will do an in-depth presentation at the public hearing. Um, but would you like to talk a little bit about that before we open it up to questions? Sure. Yeah. And again, yeah, thank you for having me. Essentially, the building code contains a portion of the building code is the energy code. And, and when you get a building permit for your project, it has to meet the energy code. And in Massachusetts, there are currently three levels of energy code. Um, there's the base code, there's the stretch code, and there's the specialized code. Amherst is currently uh, uses the stretch code, which means that it has incentive, you know, it, it regulates to, to be for buildings to use less energy, essentially. Uh, the specialized code is a next step above that. And that is, I think that's, that's the basis of this is, that's the question. Should Amherst go from the stretch code to the specialized code? Um, 
there is a lot right now in this is this is a conversation that's happening in in many towns right now we're not the only one so there's really there's an abundance of information um on this topic and i'm starting to put together a kind of a, a faq frequently asked questions there are existing faqs made by doer who developed the code there's there's other points of view out there as well the homeowners home builders association realtors have a point of view i'm trying to sort of link create a an annotated faq and i think that's the that's the goal for this meeting is you know what are the questions what are the concerns um they don't necessarily need to be questions that say you know that that are concerning questions they could be questions for which the answer would be a positive for this one way or the other and and this is a pretty neutral task right now as far as i'm concerned thank you that, um, yeah so we will just open it up to questions i'm gonna allow for questions from pam and jennifer and myself first um if john's got any john is here he's our building inspector so he can chime in with any that he wants on the list. I know he's not prepared for specialized, but if he's been thinking about it, he can chime in. I also received questions from Kathy, Shane, um, and so I will put them and share screen so that everyone can see it. Um, it will go in that document. I will forward to Athena later today to be put in today's packet, and all of those questions will be included in the document I create based on the questions today, um, but she wanted them shared. And because of open meeting law, I was hesitant to share them prior to the meeting. So we will make sure everyone can see what they are during the meeting. Um, we'll start with Jennifer. Um, hi, thank you, Jesse, for being here. I have a lot of questions because I'm a novice to, <laughs> to all this. But so one of my, I mean, the, at the most basic, and I won't ask all of them, I'll let, you know, we can go around, but I guess my first most basic is do at some point, do we do we kind of automatically go to the specialized opt-in or the specialized it that at some date all towns and cities in Massachusetts? Um, and it, would this just mean we're doing it sooner? So, yeah. I mean, so yeah. I know that we're, he's just collecting, but that I just is a basic. How, how, how do we decide? That. Yeah. So, yes and no automatic the stretch code automatically increases uh it's it's regular it's reach or it's regulations every year or in some it's not regular but so a, it just happened a year from this month next july 2024 the stretch code automatically sets better you know higher targets or lower targets i should say it's not specifically turns into exactly what the specialized goes in, but it certainly gets closer to it. And then the question, another question might be, would, would then the specialized code get further, you know, would it outpace it or do they catch up? Ultimately, from my understanding, and this is for the state and DOER, ultimately all of these codes will get to this place and the base, you know, even the non-stretch code towns will eventually be, pulled into unless there's a dramatic change in all political will in the state and country energy codes have never gone backwards that i know of so so long answer short or short answer long unfortunately to some degree yes it's going to keep getting more strict but i don't know specifically how that susses sugars out with the three different levels so they'll add another level <laughs> more, and then, more so you don't have to answer this now, but my couple of questions: Would the um, the uh, the specialized get us to our climate action goals quicker? I mean, our climate action goals are to reach carbon neutrality by twenty fifty. Does that ensure we get there sooner, or just that we get there? Um, the specialized code will should accelerate should get the state towards climate goals faster that is true i would not say that it will get us there okay last question then i'll let other people is just i read that it only applies the specialized in terms of residential single family homes if they're over because there's some concern that it's going to um increase construction costs but for single family home it only kicks in at four thousand feet or above 
4,000 square feet so that if you're building a smaller home. Some of the some of the regulations start at 4,000 square feet. Um, that's a good one. I would put that that's a that's a long answer one. OK, and yeah, put to, that, that's to, great. To, you don't have to answer it now. And it, and it, and because there's a bunch of related questions that are close to that, like renovations, partial renovations, all those things. Like what hap What are the triggers that happen when? So we'll have a good answer. Okay. For all, that whole category, yeah. Great, thank you. I'll let someone else go. I may have more. Excellent, thank you, Jennifer. Pam. Um, I think my question's sort of nitty gritty, and 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 I'm I'm sort of thinking of construction and the differences between double pane and triple plant pane as sort of a, an example. You know, there are, there are double panes with low E film and so forth that help really reduce the, the, um, the values, increase the R values, reduce the U values. And um, don't we already, you know, don't we have those kinds of improvements without having to necessarily, um, dictate that somebody use triple pane glass. And that's just an example of one component of a, of a building envelope that might change with this specialized code. So there is neither the stretch code nor the specialized code have any prescriptive measures. There's no, you have to use triple, triple glazing. I think what it's saying is, well, if, if you're gonna, if your amount of glass in the building gets to a certain point where it's a glass dominated building, then in order to reduce the amount of energy consumed and particularly the peak energy, which is what the commercial specialized code is, stretch code, I should say, rather is looking at, um, it forces you to make choices. Um, I, I know we're not supposed to answer, but I'm not sure how, so you're not required to have triple pane windows. You're, you're required to show uh, levels of, of energy consumption um, and so and those that piece of it is already in the stretch code that that's not different from it's not conceptually it's not different from the stretch to the specialized so it's, it's not so the shorter answer would have been it's not prescriptive that's not a prescriptive measure that you have to do but if you but it's possible that certain designs would re, would require the upgrade to triple pane or the reduction of glass. Mm -hmm. um, I have a follow up to Jennifer though. Um, sure. and maybe I just didn't hear you say it. Um, so next next July, the the building code itself um, upgrades. We'll get a new code. We'll get a new version of the code. Um, did you say that the that our current stretch code also will up it up the ante a little bit as well as the basic building state building code? The the stretch code in July 2024, the stretch code automatically bumps up again. Yes. Okay. And to and I don't know if this is pro or con for for people who for if it, I don't know if this pushes someone in the direction of specialized or not, but that is also the same time. That's when the specialized would take effect in Amherst would be July 2024. If if this went the way it's been mapped out currently, which so stretch code bumps up automatically and potentially it's specialized. In that, that's happened. That those two things, w one will definitely happen. One could happen same time. Thank you. I think it's me, and I, I think we're all thinking some of the same things because some of my questions have already been put out there under um, sort of different versions. But yeah, I, I had a question about, a, a, and my question regarding the July date. When when is a recommended effective date? But. Um, if the if it's July 2024 um, with the stretch code, what it looked like the stretch codes moving there, I guess what I would like to see is what's the difference between where the stretch code is intended to be next July and where the specialized code is next July so that we know exactly what 
those differences are since since it looks like that would be our effective date. So I think that's where we need to be looking at what are we mandating above the stretch code at that time. Um, so that's one of my questions. Uh, another one is, can we estimate what the cost difference between those differences would be to build various size buildings? Um, and then another question I had was, if we adopt the specialized code, there's some reading I've been doing that indicates that those additional costs communities should consider offsetting the additional cost to builders with other potential incentives. Um, and I don't know how that works since if you adopt the specialized code, it's just there. And so how do you put incentives in? But but one article I read talked about offsetting those costs with potentially things like additional density in certain areas of town or um, energy efficiency bonuses. I'm not sure what it would look like. And so I guess one of my questions is, um, would ECAC recommend adopting building type incentives or zoning type incentives if the specialized code is also adopted? Like, like how do those work together at all? And is there a recommendation from ECAC? I'm not, you know, and, and then what, what other, have our, uh, other jurisdictions done with some of that? Um, it was an article I read by builders and some building associations. So I know they have their own sort of their their opinion right but but it intrigued me um so yeah, it, oh, yeah. It, that that's a question those are sort of my questions um jennifer you seem to indicate you had more if you do we'll go back to you or i can throw up kathy's um questions now um <clears throat> i'm sorry i guess it could just be added on to like the question about you know, is there a like at 4,000 square feet? Is that where it kicks in for a single family home? I had read that it doesn't apply to historic structures, but if you maybe in answering that question, um, if it applies to retrofitting, is it said that one of the incentives was you wouldn't have to retrofit? But I guess I'm wondering at what age of a structure does, if, if that's the way it works, does the retrofitting kick in? So that was it. Yeah, I'll, I'll add the historic to that. That's that, and that is just a side note. That trigger is is has been very confusing for for various reasons to a lot of people, and including um, the people that wrote that. So <laughs> we're going to do our best to clear that up for you. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to share the screen, but I will copy all of these questions into um, the document, but but Kathy had specifically asked if I could share it on screen so that everyone could see it, so I am doing that. Um, I see a hand up. Yes. Oh, Pam? Yeah, could I just weigh in before we get into, into sure. text? Um, and I'm thinking about, and the fact that John is here in the in the audience as well, or in the panel, um, is the building is the building department able today to um, manage and um, and monitor construction techniques? And you know, what what do you receive from a builder that you have to review to assure yourself that they're meeting today's stretch code? Yes, and um, today's um, buildings have to be certified and verified by a HERS rater. So we um, look at those recommendations before we issue a permit, and then we look at those reports, um, you know, after the thing is complete. Great, I didn't realize it's good. Okay. Thank um, and thank you, John, for jumping in on that. Um, Okay, so I have put on the screen Kathy's, well, I'll, I'll page down to it. I know no one has read it, so I'll, I'll take some time. But, um, you know, um, she talked about some of these at the council meeting. Um, she, she wanted to know the cost impact um, and how much is that above what the 
current stretch code that we've already adopted would be if we know those items. Um, and I think Jennifer sort of implied or touched on this other one from Kathy, which is older housing stock. How does it impact that? Um, and, and it looks like here Kathy's done it through stretch code, but we would want that answer for specialized code in particular, since stretch code's already been adopted. Um, and Pam just touched on number three, which is the, the staff um, expertise ability to um, apply and monitor and all of that on the, uh, Kathy talks about stretch code. Um, I think she is referencing the specialized code and all of this because there's been different, different things. So I'll fix the wording and all of that as we send it through. Um, you know, and so there's some sub questions for expertise. Um, we'll include those and then a question about this, if we adopt, but our surrounding towns do not, what could be an estimated impact on construction in Amherst? Would we see a drop in construction um, because it's harder to and more expensive to build here than say in Hadley, if Hadley doesn't, doesn't adopt? Um, a timing on grid capacity. Um, and then uh, Kathy also talked about incentives here, but in a different way than I mentioned incentives. I think she's talking about incentives to builders to put in more strict energy efficiencies and, and higher energy efficiencies into their buildings, but the incentives go to them. Um, monetary incentives. The IRA is the Inflation Reduction Act for people who might not understand that, that and that is um, the federal, it was passed about eight months ago, right? Um, and it's got a lot of energy efficiency incentives where there's tax credits and stuff. And I think that's what she's referencing on that. Um, and so those are her questions. Um, I will transfer them to the document I'm creating, um, but those are, that's the document she sent me. So I hope I didn't go through that too quick um, for people to be able to read it. But like I said, I will put it in, in the packet um, for everyone. Um, so, yep. Can, so as part of the research we're doing, there's a lot of other questions that are being asked. Can as we put this together, I assume we don't have to just stick to the questions that come up today. We can we can add more questions in. Is that is that acceptable? In your minds? Yes, you can add. It, it, it's it's your um, proposal, right? And so in addition to the questions we ask, you can put any information you want in there um, to help us that you think will help us make a recommendation. So yeah, you don't have to stick to just what we have. Our questions are, are just sort of the ones that are in the front of our mind right now of what do we need that we know we need to be able to make a decision at this point. Okay, Great. Jennifer. Um, thank you. Yeah, and I guess just to add on so where my questions were coming from about square footage is in the Department of Energy Resources, the door um, frequently asked questions. It started to get into like it would apply, they mentioned to single family homes 4,000 feet is above. And I, because if, if maybe you could look at the, I guess we're not really looking to build a lot of, you know, 4,000 square foot plus houses. So if where it starts affecting construction costs are not really the kind of building we're probably going to be doing in Amherst. That would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And that's how I'm thinking about it too. I think the, the, the 4,000 square foot and over, certainly from an energy consumption, unless there's, you know, a lot of people in that house, that's, a, that's an outlier. I think for most, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to try to address that from like, I think multifamily and mixed use kind of downtown commercial projects is a is a really relevant one uh and to really try to what i'm going to try to do is cite 
you know, who's saying what about that? Um, but I think that would be a really helpful one to get cost. What are the triggers? What's the difference? You know, all those main questions. What's the difference between the stretch and the specialized? What are the triggers, whether it's a renovation or not? And then, the you know, sort of some cost information as well. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, so similar to that. If we're talking about a duplex uh, or anything larger, um, you know, that is that is that same square footage going to kick in um, at four thousand square feet? So you could barely get a, a, a duplex built and have it not trigger this. Oh, that's, that's interesting. That's, yeah, that's a that's, that's a great question. question. That's not my oh, question. But I, a follow up to Jennifer's. But I want to parse that out so let me just write that down because i'm going to get a head start on all this um the, the thing that was going through my head is that um your comment your comment just now about there's a lot of information there are a lot of questions being bandied about and and i'm going to raise the question to us in general is are we ready for a public hearing because that sort of you know, starts the ball rolling really quickly. And do we do we have the information that is appropriate for decision making? Um, you know, with just you know the the three of us chatting and bringing out ideas, you've got a lot more questions that need to get answered. Um, I'm, 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 I don't. I'm I can, let me let me answer somebody. that from my. Let me, let me just quickly answer that. From my point of view, I'm approaching this as if everyone's coming to the meeting and we should be able to answer any question that's come up in, whether it came up in Watertown six months ago or Acton or Ashford. Or I'm, I'm casting a very wide net. Now, whether you guys feel ready or not, I, I'm not, I won't speak to that, but I, I just so you know the way my list of questions is going to be much longer, I think, and, and much more in depth and really try to get to where this has been a difficult conversation in the towns that have done this before us. I'm talking to builders. I'm talking to HVAC installers. I'm going to talk to developers. So this is not the only place that I'm getting questions from. We've had two conversations with, with um, inspection services, you know, John's department already. I will keep asking them, you know, has anything new, John, if anything new comes up on your end, tell us. Like, so we want to be ready for that. But so that just that's so that's how I'm approaching it. I don't want this to be limited. Like, well, you only asked me four questions. So we're I'm casting a much wider net than that, if it's helpful. Are you good, Pam? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm gonna follow up on that. And then I'm gonna just so I know, Jesse, you were at the meeting, but because we're trying to get them, I'm gonna go through some of the questions that were mentioned at the town council meeting too, just so they've been mentioned here when they show up. Um, but but to follow up on Pam's, I guess one of the reasons, you know, I had originally thought we could hold the hearing on the 17th, and then that became clear that that would not be enough time right um so so i guess my follow so i pushed it to the september 7th but that i think means that we would need the basic documents by around the end of the month um to give the committee about a week to review it i know that's like th that's about three no that that is about four weeks from now so the august 31st or so um which is right before the holiday weekend um that we'd be looking at so um, I know you might not have an answer to that now, but um, we have to post the public hearing on no later than August 24th. Um, and so I guess what I would request is if the 21st rolls around, August 21st rolls around and you're looking and saying, you know, I'm not going to have these documents ready for the 31st, let me know um, so that because then we'll just push the hearing to the next September meeting, um, you know, before we get it posted. But just so you know, we have to post two weeks in advance on the bulletin board for the to meet the requirements. Um, so I will put that in the document too. Oh, Athena might correct me on this. Athena. <laughs> 
Oh, not on the hearing, but I think Pam was alluding to a deadline after the hearing, and maybe I misunderstood you, but there's not a deadline after the hearing like there is for zoning changes. This is just a regular bylaw. Yeah, so so to, to clear that up, Pam, we can continue the hearing if we're still not ready to close the hearing on the 7th. Um, but even if we decide we're closing the hearing, even if we can't come to a recommendation, there is no deadline for the council to vote that would, if we didn't vote by, that would require holding another hearing, unlike with zoning bylaws, I think was what Athena was saying. Thank you. Um, okay, so would you, I would, able, so would you be able to just tell me the, 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 the series of dates again? So sure. I can, or I can say yeah. August 21st is when I would want to know whether you can have documents and the answers to the questions to me by August 31st. And August 31st is when I would want the documents for the packet for a hearing on the 7th. Wait, oh, it only needs to be one week ahead? Okay. One yeah, week is the hearing. So the packet, I, I think one week, unless yep. the committee thinks they need more time, I think giving the committee one week to review the documents. We've had an extensive amount in this one. Um, so it would be the answers to these questions and any other additional documents. And if you send other documents to both Pam and I earlier, um, we'll find a way to get them posted. <laughs> between vacation schedules and everything, we will find a way to get them posted earlier. But um, a week is when, a, a week is the least amount of time I would wanna give everyone to review the quest, the answers to the questions we've asked. Um, so I would want those to us by the August 31st for September 7th hearing. But because the hearing needs posted by August 24th, it would be good to know on the 21st or 22nd, whether you can make the 31st date. Does that make sense, Jesse? It really does. Okay. <laughs> um, um, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and I will put that in, in, the, in, in the thing I send you tonight. Um, the questions that were mentioned at the council meeting. Um, was um, this one doesn't really apply to ECAC, which was about referral, which was from Pat that said, why can't ECAC make a proposal and then just bring it to GOL? Um, so that that referred more to the, the referral than anything. Um, Andy asked um, what staff time is needed to help us make a wise recommendation. So again, that's I don't know how much that relates to this, but I will put some of that in there. Um, Paul actually asked, the town manager asks, um, what are the ramifications of this? Um, can we comply if, yeah, if, if a supply chain isn't there, how, how does it comply and how does it affect building and, and everything? And then also, how do we train our staff to implement this? What types of additional training might our staff need to go to the specialized code from the stretch code? Um, if any, um, and then knowing an effective date. Um, so those were the other questions I had wrote down at the council meeting. Are there any other questions from the committee at this time? So the next question I have for the committee is, there is a draft bylaw. I know I put it in late and I'm not sure I emailed the committee that it went into the packet. Um, so I'm going to pull that up just so um, it's here and there's a sample motion. So what was in the packet was a sample bylaw from DOER. And what this draft is, is basically that formatted for our bylaws. <laughs> I will say that right now. It's not much different. There's a little bit of cleaning up going on and a little bit of rearranging and a little bit of word changing from that, that sample bylaw. Um, in looking at, I, I had sent the, the sample bylaw on to Anna 
um, as council sponsor. I don't know whether she sent it to you, Jesse, or not. She wrote back and said, it looks like the sample bylaw is all we need. Um, and so that meant what we weren't sure of is would we modify the current stretch code bylaw, which is what's in red here. Um, and with Anna thinking just adopt, basically propose and adopt the, propose to adopt the sample bylaw from DOER, I, I basically created this document that said it would be a rescind and replace, rescind the current one and replace it with specialized energy code as sample. Um, and so some of the things in here, this this is the this is what it was. So the purpose, I think I just combined a little bit. The definitions, I got rid of some of the purpose statements that were in the definition. So if you look at the sample bylaw from DOER and this one, um, some of those um, purpose statements, I just moved up to the purpose line instead of keeping it within the definitions. I tried to streamline the definitions a little bit. Um, there was a note in the definitions about the stretch code, um, and I basically moved that note into the definitions from having a footnote in a bylaw, which made no sense to me. Um, and then the adoption looks slightly different. Um, because I based the adoption language on how we adopted the stretch code. And so the current language in our stretch code bylaw instead of the DOER language. Um, so that's, but that's basically what it is. Um, so I guess my question is this at this point, unless there are any recommended changes right now, is the language I would request that Athena post in the in the public hearing notice for the bylaw thing. Um, but we can make changes to it now. Jesse, you can forward me a different version if people decide it needs to be a different version at some point, um, but that's the plan. So Pam, thoughts? Um, yeah, thanks for reminding us that you actually put it in the, uh, in the packet. So the existing one says um, to adopt the provisions of 780 CMR, which is the stretch code, in place of the provisions set forth under 780 CMR 13.00, et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, you don't include that as replace the, the, um, the code sections themselves. Is that so that in case the code sections get renumbered, we don't have to go back and renumber this? So it was actually because I did not look up whether those four sections that are listed here right. are the only sections affected by these appendices and CMR 22 and 23. And so I was concerned that if there were more sections affected by the, C the specialized code, if we only listed the four, then we'd run into maybe a conflict. And I'm not knowledgeable enough to know whether those four with the stretch code that were in the stretch code adoption were the only four affected. Does that make sense, Pam? Yep. So, so that's why I just changed it to applicable provisions of the Mass State Building Code. Um, it will, it will potentially, I, I would say, it would potentially stop us from having the problem we have right now, which is this is no longer the reference to the stretch code anymore as seen in this. Um, it's it's now 22 and 23, not appendix 115 AA. Um, we won't we'll still have that problem because we're still referencing these. So if the state decides to change that, we'll but but at okay. least now it'll say this. Okay. So point made it 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 would track a an incorrect, potentially an incorrect reference. Hopefully, yes. That's the goal. Any other questions, concerns, or anything at this point on this draft bylaw itself? Because that's what we would, in theory, be making the recommendation on, is the language itself. Jennifer. So and do we have to run this by the council since they voted to refer other language? So the council voted, let me pull up that referral. Um, the council's motion was to 
authorize the CR, oh wait, to refer the memo regarding the specialized code to develop amendments to general bylaw 3.48 stretch energy code consistent with the memo, and then were to send those amendments to GOL for review. Okay. Right, so they didn't send specific language that we've changed without them. No, saying, right? because there was no language proposed. Right. The proposal was just adopt the energy code. And so they told us because they, they just told us come yeah. up with. Language. Okay, that's good. That's fine. And I think it's worth mentioning, and, and, and this was discussed at the meeting, that there's no leeway on this is a binary decision. It's adopt or not. And there's nothing. So. So from our point of view, and I've actually been advised, don't get involved in any part of the bylaw writing or anything. So I'm, I'm, I think, you know, uh, you guys understand this. I do not understand politics at all. Um, but yeah, it's not a, there's, we have no legal ability to design this to be kind of specifically what we want it to be. It's yes or no. And so if that, that's, I think that's worth mentioning. So I'll, I'll just clarify that. So for example, if we liked appendices RC, but not CC, we can't choose to adopt just RC. That's, that's we have to adopt both or none, basically, is the decision. Okay. Anything else before we say goodbye to the specialized code for today? Pam? Um, I would just say I'm I'm certainly not ready to even talk about the the wording of a proposed motion. We haven't had a hearing. We haven't heard, you know, anything. So, it, so it's great, it's great to have a draft, but I don't. I think it's so that draft motion also came from the DOER modified for what it would look like for us. So I just didn't want to lose their draft. Well, in, in the thing. So I figured I'd just keep it with it. Um, yep. I thought it was very nice the DOER provides those drafts, but the draft motions were related to a town meeting, not a town council. Um, so it needed modified. And so I just modified it for that. But yeah, it's it's meant for information purposes at this point. I am in no way proposing a motion at this time. Um, I just didn't want to lose how they worded theirs, basically. Um, anything else? Seeing none, I want to thank Jesse for taking the time to join us today. I will send out that document. Um, I'll, I'm going to format what we talked about, and I'm just going to format it nicely so everyone can find it. And I will send that document out tonight to you and Anna and um, Stephanie Ciccarella, um, who is staff liaison to ECAC and our climate um, specialist. So um, she could not be here today. She has the hearing on her um, agenda. Um, so I hope she will be able to join us in September. Um, but she she was invited today, but she had a conflict. So she could not make it today. And so um, we should be able to see her in September and ask her questions too. Um, and it sounds like John, well, you might not be here in September for the hearing, but I will make sure Rob or someone from the building commissioners knows about the hearing and is invited? Or will you still be here, John? No, September 1st, last day. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? <laughs> it's four uh, weeks. Four weeks from, from today is four weeks from tomorrow. Um, one month, so thank you. So much, so much to say. John, thank you so much, I, I, yeah. Oh, thank all of you um, for taking the time. I, this is your time as well. Um, you guys work so hard and we added this to your plate. So I really appreciate it. It's nice to see you all. And congratulations, John. And I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jesse. <laughs> With that, um, we are going to move to residential um, rental, where am I? Um, our residential rental stuff. Um, so we have a few, I have all three on here. We had one outstanding issue on the bylaw, which was regarding um, whether it, Rob interpreted it as applying to ADUs. 
the answer we got was yes, it does. So there's um, from that but point of view. Yep, Pam. Use use um, full sentences. So refer oh. Jack. I know what you're talking about, but nobody listening does. Yeah. So so thank you for that. We had a question last week when we were reviewing the draft bylaw of whether because of some wording in the exceptions to whether you needed to for exceptions for who needed to obtain a residential permit on whether those exceptions meant that um, properties that had a accessory dwelling unit on them, uh, units that are sometimes referred to as granny flats or in-law apartments, um, if they rented that accessory dwelling unit, would they have to obtain a rental permit? And we weren't sure based on the language whether that was the case or not. And so we wanted clarification on that. And Rob wrote back and said, yes, the language that we have in the bylaw would require those that have accessory dwelling units and rent them out to obtain a permit. Um, and so that was the answer we were looking for in that we wanted to ensure that those units did have to obtain a permit. Um, so I don't think we have, uh, from my point of view, that was the only outstanding question on our pending questions list. So I'm not sure we have to review the bylaw anymore, but I will leave it up to Pam and Jennifer to see if they have other things they would like to review on that before we move on to regulations and then the fee structure. So and, Pam, and, call your hand. Okay, two two things. One, you did mention um, public comment before we started oh, this. Yes, sorry. And then I'll have a question. Thank you for that. And I know Jesse's gone, but it will be able to put it in there. I apologize. My my brain didn't. So yeah, I will do public comment now. Um, I apologize to everyone for having mentioned that and then screwed it up in my own <laughs> set. So thank you for the reminder. Um, public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC will be accepted at this time. Residents are welcome to express their views for one to three minutes, to three minutes, up to three minutes. Um, uh, we will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. And I just want to say this is a general public comment. It does not have to be specifically on the specialized code. It can be within anything within our jurisdiction, including anything that's on the agenda for today. Um, so let me find my participant list. Um, with that, I'm going to recognize Jasna Reggae. Um, please un. I am the host. So, um, Jasna, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment. Hello. Uh, first, I just wanted to check, is this the appropriate an appropriate time to comment or to ask questions about the rental permit? Yes. Okay, thanks. I'm Josna Reggae. I live on 96 Farview Way. And my, my concern relates to the conditions under which a rental permit is going to be granted to owners of non-owner occupied properties, how um, inspections and enforcement will happen in non-owner occupied rental units, and the difference in general between how owner occupied and non-owner occupied rentals will be handled. So I just very quickly want to use a current situation in my neighborhood as an example um, that we're facing in our neighborhood and then uh, just raise questions that would relate to that and whether the new bylaws might address them. Um, in my neighborhood, uh, two brothers who have since 2004 owned a non-owner occupied duplex rented to students on 798 to 800 North Pleasant Street have applied for a special permit um, to build a new non-conforming duplex on the same lot. It has come just come to our attention that they're renting their existing duplex without a rental permit, even as they're proposing to build another bigger one. So I wonder, under the revised rental permit bylaw, uh, these are questions I have. Would inspection services have the ability and have the resources to identify rental properties in town and to contact property owners such as the Casey brothers who are renting without a permit? Um, second, to use the example of the same property, given the owner's long track record of negligence and violations, if or when they did apply for a permit, would it be just automatically granted to them? Or under what conditions might it be granted or denied? Would the rental history of the applicants be scrutinized? 
Um, again, using this example, if a once a rental permit were granted or if it were granted, would non-occupied owner occupied rental um, have to pay a higher rental fee for their permits in order to help pay the cost of conducting regular inspections? And how often would inspections be conducted to check on the actual conditions in the rental property? Uh, in this situation, these uh, owners owned it for more than 16 years and ran it into the ground and it finally had to be declared unfit for human habitation. Do we have to wait that long? Will fines for violations be increased to pay for the cost of regular inspections and also for as deterrence? What, what other consequences would absentee owners pay, face for them? And bear with me, I just have two more questions like this, all related to this same situation. Should a certain number or seriousness of violations in a rental unit automatically trigger the permanent revocation of a property owner's rental permit? And finally, again, using this situation in my neighborhood, would a long history of violations have a bearing on the outcome of an application for a spe special permit to construct a second rental property? Uh, would it be appropriate for inspection services to provide information on their record to the Zoning Board of Appeals, for example? And I know John Thompson is here, and John, you know about this property. Um, so yes, um, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Jasna, for your um, questions and comments. Um, we do not generally respond to that, but that does not mean if you stay for the conversation, you won't hear some answers to those questions. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, um, seeing no other hands, I am going to close public comment at this time. Um, thank you, Pam, again, for reminding me about that. Um, so back to residential rental bylaw. We are on the bylaw. Any last um, questions? We voted the a recommendation on the bylaw pending resolution of final questions. Um, last meeting, are there any final questions and any final requests for revision? Pam. Yeah, I do have some, and, and I and I would actually at some point like to um, have somebody at least uh, respond to some of those questions because it's imminent and it's and it's current. Um, in, you know, going through one last read of this material, um, did I just put it? Oh yeah, okay. Um, under section F, application, it's our new section F, application, uh, application requirements in order to obtain. We go through all this about how to contact the owner, the names and addresses, et cetera, et cetera, of the of the person in charge. We never say the address of the property and or the unit or units described. It's a, it's a it's implied, but we just don't actually ever say it. I think we we cover it in the regulations, but it, to me, it probably ought to be in here as well. So let me pull up the regulations. Um, you're you're basically proposing to move that from the regulations, which is section, it is actually section A, 1A, the first thing listed in the application requirements for the regulations. Um, and you're proposing to move it from the regulations to the bylaw itself, the address of the residential rental property. Is that? Yes, I think so, because H, H talks about the requirements for person in charge, all the contact information, et cetera. We also state it here, so we've, we've been redundant at least once already, but it just seemed like a no-brainer that we would start out first and foremost with the address. Are you proposing not to delete it from the regulations? Correct. Not okay, delete it, not delete but it, just it. add it to the bylaw like this. Yep, thank you. Okay, any other yes. requests? Yes. Oh, Pam um, and Jennifer. Go ahead, if Jennifer wants to, I, I've got two more. No, no, go ahead and ask them, definitely. 
this is this is actually kind of pertinent to the questions that were just raised, but in in section G, issuance or denial, uh, a conditional permit. So we go um, most of the way through that paragraph, and it does say that if after reinspection the rental property does not pass, the principal code in, in official may either extend the conditional permit for an additional period of time to further allow for compliance and reinspection or may deny the application for a permit. That in my mind, it leaves the door so wide open. Does that actually give us any leverage at all? Leverage for for clamping down if mm -hmm. if if in fact we just keep giving an additional period of time and then another additional period of time ad nauseum, do we ever actually have the leverage to deny the permit? So I interpret that to mean, well, well, we give we give the leverage and we give that ability to Rob. John can talk about this and and think his thoughts, but but the way I interpret it is Rob has or John or the inspector has the ability to say, you know, we gave you thirty days and you've done absolutely nothing. We're not giving you another thirty days. You haven't even tried. I'm just denying the application. No more conditional permit. Or we gave you thirty days and you repaired everything we identified but hey in the last 30 days we've identified two more things we'll extend the conditional permit so you can fix those two things and we'll be back in 30 days after you fix that so in my mind it's one of those things where we have to trust our inspectors to use those options appropriately um and and all that that's my thoughts but john do you have any thoughts on pam's question no, I think you're right that that's that's how that would play out. Okay, so we so what we what we got rid of is the point system of x number of violations equals absolutely no permit. And so I'm thinking about our current friends on Taylor Street with the with the mattresses left outside for I don't know how many months now. Um and and being being cited in violation, um, I just want to make sure that in our regs and in our nuisance bylaw that we that we have the ability to close something down that is just flagrantly snubbing the nose at any efforts to um, to control. Yeah, so so I want to say the conditional permit is for an application that's been filed um, and that meets everything but that inspection requirement because it failed the inspection or hasn't had the inspection yet. Um, but we do have, I'm trying to find it here, um, we do have a suspension or revocation a section where we did we got rid of the point system, but we did put in that if there are multiple orders to remedy, um, three or more notices of violation um, issued within three years of the most recent one, that we're giving the code official the option of suspending or revoking that permit at that time. So it's not quite that strict point system that we had originally talked about and contemplated and talked through, but we did keep that idea in here for suspending and revocation. And if there's a suspension or revocation out there under denial, I apologize for all the, under denial, they cannot get a new one under when the year flips through they can't when that's when that permit is suspended they cannot get a new one okay i think i'm comfortable with that okay. and then my last my last item is um also section g on uh, number six and we have um yeah um, hold on. Read that. Um, it's about the transfer of permit. It starts transfer permit. Yeah. So um, 
second looks like second sentence the new owner if you could find that yeah okay the new owner or designated operator of the rental property i don't think we use the term designated operator anywhere we use person in charge right we could get rid of it completely we could say the new owner of the residential rental property, or we could just say the new owner or person in charge of the residential rental property. Which would you like? We'd have both. Great. I think Jennifer's next. Um, yes, thank you. So I just have a general question if I could ask John, um, because you know, I um, attended, I zoomed into the ZBA meeting for 798 to 800 North Pleasant Street. And when I looked in the packet, I was kind of shocked to see there's five pages of a police call log over more than you know, an, an extended number of years. So these property owners were, well, two things. I mean, they were allowed to keep renting, although I suppose if I just learned through the comments that um, public comment that they didn't have, if they didn't have a rental permit, if they've never had a rental permit, I suppose the permit couldn't be revoked. Um, but would, so a general overall question, the way we have revised and tried to tighten the residential rental property bylaw, would it kind of put a stop to, I'm just gonna use the term scoff law, to a landlord that has a series of violations over a number of years. Would we get, would, would the situation that we've had, that we've had with some usually absentee, always absentee landlords be, would, are we gonna be able to address those? Will this, what our revisions do what we're intending to do and not allow a situation like that to just sort of go on? That's part of my question. Then the other question is, what kind of a penalty should we have for uh, landlords who just don't get a rental permit? And it's not because they don't know that we have rental permitting. It was a kind of two-part question. Don? Um, the first part of the question, say that again, Jennifer. Will our um, revised bylaw really, what we're trying to do is prevent and the kind of situation that happens where year after year after year, there, it, we have a nuisance property or problem property that, and the situation just doesn't get better. Because yes, so in most cases, this bylaw addresses that. Not, not, not least of which through the tool where we'll be in these properties. Um, so um, it'll be much less common for us to, you know, then go to a complaint at a property and, you know, do five pages of violations because we've already been to this property. We already had those things rectified. Um, some of those other nuisances, behavioral nuisances, no, this this is can't be addressed here. That's those are police matters mostly. But what about our nuisance bylaw? Yeah, that's not enforced by me. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, um, and then my other question, just generally, because we haven't really, you know, we've talked about trying to, you know, how we can implement strategies and get out information so that everybody knows they. If you're renting, if you have a rental property, you have to get a rental permit. Yes. But what can we do, you know, when that's just, they're just not getting a permit? So I think this, this place is um, a legacy of having switched our permitting program. So we went from, you know, the old system where you filled out a thing and you paid for it by check to an online system. And some properties, slipped through the cracks there and we haven't 
been able to chase them all down yet. Um, you know, it's hard to identify a property that you don't know about. Um, right. So, you know, we find out about this. I mean, I was asked a question about this property. First thing I do is a little research and say, oh, yeah. And by the way, they don't have a rental permit. But I mean, I'm not on a daily basis going through, you know, lists of properties to see do they do they have a current permit or not. It comes up in the course of other investigations. Um, and so now... Yes, we know the Casey's don't have one. They also don't have a local agent. That's, it's not that they never had that. They had rental permits in the past and they had local agents in the past. When they, when the place got condemned and, and rehabbed, um, you know, they fell out of that system. Yeah, I'm certainly not holding, the, you know, inspections department has no control over it, but just should we, I guess I'm just kind of saying to, us on CRC, should we have something, some sort of penalty if you don't get a permit? I mean, well, I mean, if you don't get a permit and I've identified you, first they have to be identified in order for you to, right. to be punitive. So right. now we have, I'll give you till Friday, you know, to, to get that done online. And if you don't do it, it's a hundred bucks a day. That's, okay. we already have that ability. I already have that. That's the best. We already, way. we use that. Right. Yeah. And I guess. I was thinking, could you say you have a year when you can't get a permit, but I suppose we can't do that. So we, we have not written the, you can't get one if you haven't had one in, but but what I will say is one thing in writing the report that, that I noticed that I hadn't actually been thinking of is John just said it, the current bylaw is $100 a day for not having a permit. We've upped it to 300 in the proposal, which is a lot steeper, right? It still might not be enough, but it might be a lot more to get them into applying for the permit and once they get applying for the permit because we're changing to the town inspection those health and safety issues should decrease dramatically over the course of the next five or six years if this is adopted um I, the one thing i wanted to say about the behavioral issues while not in here because we ran into those a lot of discussions, if you remember, about what is the purpose of this particular bylaw and who is it regulating and all. But we did keep in the regulations um, the ability to for our inspectors to declare a more frequent inspection schedule than once every five years or whatever. If the property is found in violation or receives a citation as a nuisance house. Um, we've kept that in the regulations as sort of on the frequency schedule for inspections. And so while it's not something that at this point would prohibit them from obtaining a permit, um, and part of the reason, again, in the report I wrote was we're in the middle of figuring out what that nuisance bylaw is going to look like, right? We, we've started that and we haven't gotten back to a major revision of the nuisance house bylaw, right? And so maybe when we do, we can go back to this and, and figure out a way to work that in. But for now, we've said, well, if you're going to buy if you're found in violation of that bylaw, our inspections department can say, hey, we're going in yearly now. You're not under five years. We're going in yearly. Um, and on the fee schedule, we've we've tentatively adopted. We'll, we'll get back to that one soon. That would actually cost more, too, because we're we're adopting fees for every inspection for every inspection yeah so a five-year inspection schedule is one-fifth the fee basically than a one-year inspection schedule too um okay Which underscores the reason for the inspection program yes <laughs> um okay pam yeah my question is um when are we going to get back to talking about the nuisance bylaw do we have that on the agenda it is it is yeah. on the agenda for the 17th as basically the only thing, unless there's questions on these that need answered because of Monday's meeting. So the goal is to focus on nuisance once we get through all of this. So yeah, um, that's the plan. Nuisance so August through whenever, hopefully we can get it done. So yeah. Um, any other questions on the bylaw? And, and simply because I think it's, I think it's an important part of the package mm -hmm. of of bylaw regs and nuisance property. Yeah. So it it's the next high priority. 
Um, anything else with the bylaw? I will add this and I, I have promised Athena that tonight she will get all the documents that are necessary from this meeting um, for Monday's meeting. Um, however much we do it, she'll get it all tonight. Post CRC, um, dis so, post GOL discussion. Post GOL discussion, she'll have them all tonight. They might get posted tomorrow, but I will leave this one in tracked version because of the concern and, and the ease so that everyone can see exactly what changed from what they've been looking at in the packet. It'll be an obvious in red, here's what's changed. Um, with that, we're going to move on to regulations. Um, are there any requested changes to the regulations? Let me pull them up um, so we can see what we were referring to um, with this. This was the application thing where we had mentioned the address. I just copied it from here into the bylaw. Pam asked to keep it in here so we won't be changing the regulations on that one. Any other requested changes to the regulations we voted last time? I could not find any outstanding items on it, which is why there's no comments here. Um, but if there's requested changes, we'll make them. Pam. Again, while John is here, um, you know, I, um, I I would just ask for the one last time, you know, is there any way that we can make sure this does, in fact, accomplish what we wanted it to? Is, is it good? Is it, you know, is it solid? And will we get the results that hope for. Thoughts, John? I mean, I haven't had a um, a hard look at this. Um, let me do that. And I'll, um, can I email you thoughts? Yeah, e email them. You can email them to the committee and then I'll make sure they get distributed to or mentioned at the council meeting. Okay. Jennifer. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, I don't know if this is to John or just, are we comfortable with, um, I think it's A1E. Um, yeah, that I think part of it was we were just, you know, trying to get a sense of the number, you know, so we had some sort of inventory of houses that were rented to students. Um, and I guess we decided to frame it as unrelated occupants. Do we? feel that that's going to capture the information. So this, I think E was trying to figure out how many people are in each unit, not necessarily whether they're students or not. And G is trying to- Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I Yeah. I focused on E and I then didn't. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Boy, you have this memorized. <laughs> this is <laughs> no, I mean, you know every section of <laughs> so I've spent a lot of time with it. Yeah, I know. Anything else for the regulations? Seeing none, we will move on to um the fee schedule. So I created a new um well, Rob answered a lot of questions. That document was in the packet. And I then created a new fee schedule and a new fee sample set of documents um, based on the fee schedule as we've talked about it. So I can I I'd like to know which one would people want up the fee schedule that just has the list A, B, C that we've been staring at, or do people want to see the samples based on the schedule? Can we just look at the breakdown of data first? Yeah. Oops, it's not that one. That's that's straight from that's um it's the rental permit breakdown data. Oh, on the on the fee schedule. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um So this, this tab of the, um, of the Excel spreadsheet, A through D is what matches what I just put up from the fee schedule is, is the data Rob gave us and, and matches that, um, F 
through I is my attempt to calculate some things for the purposes of estimating fee revenue and um, inspection revenue. Um, so, you know, oh, so, I, Pam, yep, Pam. So I, I had some comments that in a, in a way to make it a little more understandable, uh, top row headings, one, two, three, fourth one says total, total permitted, total permits. And I think we need to add the word total parcels permitted. Okay. Um, that way we understand that that these are just parcels. They're far, far less than the actual number of units. So um, that looks fine. And actually the math on the first column down at the bottom should be 180 three, which you did use somewhere else, but for some reason it's 182 here. This one? Yep. Oh, I, I took that directly from him. I didn't actually sum. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, it's, it's not. Um... Oh, no, this was rental units, sorry. So this is the number of rental units. Right. So if you do the math for each of those, it's actually it's actually 183. 110 plus 40 is 150 plus 24, 74 plus 4 is 78 and 5 is 83. Okay. Yep. Um, again, going across the top, so it'd be column H, approximate number of units above the first to be inspected. I, I clearly did not understand what that meant or couldn't remember what the intent was. So the intent on this was for me to figure out when we get to inspection fee options, when we're adding, oh, wait, no, hold on. When the application fee options, we were talking about an additional fee, and even with inspections, an additional fee that the base fee would include the first unit, and the additional fee would be for every unit above one, both in this, um, in the application fee and in the inspection fee. And so, what, and so that relates to column H, my attempt to figure out, okay, if we're doing fees for a base fee of 50 or whatever, and then so that, that's what column H is. Yep. Okay. And then um, the the approximate parcels to be inspected each year, I I sort of questions, question what that actually gives us, because it really is immaterial. Um, we're really uh, interested in the number of, of units ultimately that get inspected. No, because we have to determine to determine an inspection fee to to estimate the fee since there's a base fee per parcel. We need to know how many parcels there are as well as how many units. So if you're doing 100 units on one parcel, that's going to be a completely different fee revenue than if you're doing 100 units on 100 parcels. So it's an attempt. That's why I always say approximate on those because you have a lot of guesses in those numbers. <laughs> yeah. So um, then my my follow up then question is on your. Let's see. It starts with yellow cells or variables, and it's the inspection. I I, I just jumped to the inspection fee. Um, so over on column let's see average number of units inspected per year so we've got this number and i'll i'll accept the math um, as it is but the 1348 is the number of units expected to be inspected per year and i think that was something that was based on 5000 divided by 5 i'm guessing 5000 135. So this one? 
Yeah. So this one on this sheet is just a sum of these numbers. And I cross-checked it with over here. Um, and here we get 1034 or so on this breakdown data of approximate units to be inspected each year, 1,034. And so we go to here, that's where this number comes in. But these next two numbers relate to follow-up inspections. So there's approximately 1,000 units that will need inspected every year just for permitting purposes. Some of them will fail inspection. And so when they fail, they'll get re-inspected. So that's this number here in E8. And then there's a certain number of complaint inspections, number of complaints called into inspectional services per year. And that's a different number of inspections. And so when you add all of those up together, you get that number. Yep. Okay. So so I'll I'll accept the math. So the question is though, somewhere else you had how many, how many um units can a can a person inspect in a year? And I think the number was two hundred. Yes. So the, so the question is. On this and this being just you know an annual number, do we need six point five inspectors to do the work to inspect thirteen hundred and forty eight units? So that's something John or Rob Rob estimated, and that two hundred is number of inspections, and i I wasn't sure whether that is parcel inspections, which would be three or so inspectors or whether that is unit inspections. We're talking units. Well, I mean, well, I don't know what Rob, what number, Rob gave me the 200. And I just don't know, I, we need to clarify that or finance will need to clarify that. Um, but it's, yeah, Rob had actually estimated, I think two and a half to three inspectors for this program. So I don't know whether that is these numbers and Rob's not here, maybe John has had those conversations with Rob or whether that is those numbers. Um, these are just an attempt to give people an idea of, of everything. They're very fluid numbers. Well, John? They're fluid, they're fluid but, if we, but if we are sending this along as sort of an explanation of our, of our thinking, then we need to have right. it kind of accurate. We're, we're I, I've, I've tried to based on things I've gotten from Rob and everything. John, do you have any thoughts? We've had a couple conversations about, um, you know, what how many units you might be able to do, how long does it take to do a unit, that sort of thing. But I've not had any conversations with Rob about how many inspectors he might need to hire. Okay. Yeah, he had that in a, we had asked him that and I know I have to hunt the document back up that we we posted in a packet for that answer. And I think it was around three, in addition to the ones we have now. So if you have if you have um I haven't if you have a let's let's say you have a 2000 hour 2080 hours per week of of uh, a person on salary. Um, and that means that every 10 hours, you're having to produce another inspection, write it up, follow up. <clears throat> 200 sounds probably not too far off. Right. Yeah, Rob estimated that each, each inspection takes about an hour and a half. Um, when you get above three units, you have to add another hour for every inspection. That was his estimates. So these numbers here, what I put in yellow are basically just this. Is, I, I call them variables. Uh, as Pam has pointed out, some of these numbers are best guesstimates um, in terms of what can be, you know, based on data. Those numbers might not be they're they're guesstimates. They're but they're they're best based on the permit data we've gotten and the information from Rob. The stuff in yellow is really um, where if you change if you change the numbers in white, you might get different numbers over here. But this is yeah, you know, if we decide we were trying for um, 
an inspection base fee of $100, if I typed 100 in, the total fee number would just change. Um, and you'd see that number change and this num number here change. Um, and so that's why I called those the variables. Those are more like the numbers we'd be sending to finance to kind of play with based on the estimates we've made. Um, and same with application fees. So the application fees, um, again, the numbers down here were based on items Rob gave me. Um, the three sets here are based on what at the last meeting we as a committee had tentatively agreed on would be the application sort of um, breakdown in terms of where fees might change. And um, an owner occupied parcel that had up to six units would have one fee. Um, an owner that had a principal residence in town and owned no more than three rental dwelling units, whether that be one, three parcels with one unit each, or one parcel with three units, or one parcel with two units and one parcel with one unit, it wouldn't matter. A, a different fee, for, and, and that fee would apply to each parcel that that owner owns. Um, and then all other parcels would have also a base fee. And, and as you can see, um, I only put in additional fee per rental unit for really I put a number in for the third one, all other parcels, because that's the one we had really talked about, but I left all three in yellow. We could potentially aim to recommend additional fees for the other ones we had actually not on our fee schedule, which is why those numbers are zero, um, because our tentative fee schedule was only going to recommend an additional fee per unit above one unit for the all other parcel line. Um, and so we could make as many options as people want, but I put two in there just to give an idea of for, for people. We were, I think our plan was to just send this on, but send it on with our proposed structure, which is why I created this. Pam, and then I think Jennifer might've had her hand up. Jennifer had her hand up. Jennifer. Well, Pam, if you had a follow-up question. Can... It, it, was, it was more just, is it possible for um, the department to actually under, be able to identify who has three units? I think so. You can, uh, they can probably um, produce a report from yeah. act permits to see, you know, how many of them have common ownership. Okay, thank you. Jennifer? Yeah, I just have a couple of questions about when it gets to the finance committee. Um, so the finance committee would confer with Rob about how many staff would be needed and what the cost for the program would be. And then that would be, they'd factor that into how they set the rates. So I, I can't answer for what finance would act, would ultimately do. I would forward on this document in an Excel spreadsheet so that finance and Sean Mangano have a chance to play with it. And Sean's much better at Excel spreadsheets than I ever am. He might be able to do something different with it. Um, um, I would form, for, forward on the structure document, which is just a Word document that we've generally been looking at. Um, and I would forward on all of the answers that Rob has provided to us that generated some of these assumptions, right? The assumptions about average numbers of inspections the you know the 200 a year on this the we asked them a whole lot of questions to help us make some of these guesses and all and then they would also have the bylaw that and regulations that actually also generate some of these assumptions right if the council decides to change the inspection frequency from every five years to every three years well that changes the spreadsheet, right? So right now it's based on what we're sending to them. Um, if the council's like, we don't want every five years, they would have to change these assumptions to match the bylaw and regulations as the council wants them to be. But those are essentially the three-ish documents I intend to send to finance. And we'll include all of them in the packet if we vote a recommendation today, they will all be in the packet too. Um, so that they have basically as much information as we've had um, with our, I would hope finance would have 
Rob or John in the conversation as well as Sean. Um, because one they of the better things, get to it fast. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Um, because one of the things we've struggled with is we've got a Rob estimated, and I don't have that here at all, but I think he estimated a total program cost based on our um based on the current bylaw of approximately a half million dollars a year, 450,000. I'm not sure what the right number was, but he estimated an actual number. Um, and one thing we've struggled with is, do we have to match that number? Finance is the one that can really make those recommendations on how much of that number should be from fees versus from other parts of the budget or and, and things. So all of that would go into my report. Yeah, and last thing, and finance, we would give them, I don't know if you have to, the leeway if they wanted to, you know, slightly change the structure. Yeah. I, they would essentially have that leeway because we'd be forwarding them and, and saying, come up with fees. And so in theory, they'd be able to say, you know, we don't like what CRC <laughs> sent us, right? Um, <laughs> we're just trying to help them because right, we're just giving, we yeah. struggled with, there's so many options. Right. Here's our conversations with, what we think the options match best. Right. Every, all of the hearing we've done, all of the listening we've done and, and comments we've received and all. Okay. And there'll be public comment and finance. So people, yeah. Yep. yeah. So I'm going to stop this share um, and I'm going to put the, this is the document we've been spending the most time with. Um, we can put numbers in some of these if we want. We can leave numbers blank. We could potentially put number, we, we've essentially put a number in the permit renewal late fee, um, <laughs> right? Um, but um, which also goes to one of the questions we had discussed today, which is if they don't have a permit and John finds them, well, they didn't, if they had one and then never renewed it, well, the late fee is what might apply because they haven't renewed their permit, right? Um, and that's actually much more steep than a daily fine almost, um, depending on the fee, um, but it might be both. So Pam. Yeah, we had a good comment from uh, Renata Shepard about item D and that was the transfer of permit fee. <clears throat> and, and she made a good point, uh, owner X, sells a property, owner X has already paid a, a, a fee for that year, owner Y comes in and owner Y will be required to, to pay the fee, fee for the following year, you know, when, when they uh, end up going to renew and that it seemed, it seemed excessive and she recommended taking it away. And I, I, I thought about it and I said, yeah, that it's just sort of, twisting the knife a little bit we're we're trying to we're trying to collect money where it's maybe not really needed yeah i i guess my question is for john which is changing the name of the owner and stuff mid year is is there an expense to that for the town yeah it's an admin expense you know so if somebody sits at a computer and makes that change i don't know how long that takes 15 minutes um it's not doesn't cost a hundred dollars probably but you know those salaries have uh benefits attached to them and it's not without a cost do we have a recommendation you know it, it's listed as an option as a potential fee in the bylaw and i would certainly want to leave it as an option in the bylaw um we can always send the schedule through if we have a recommendation not to actually implement one at this time um, or implement one, we could send it through with a recommendation for an actual number if we wanted to put a number in there for um, for consideration. I guess sending it through without that on the list would be recommending a number of zero, right? Um, or we could put a number in there of, you know, the range in other communities that I saw was 2550 or frankly zero if they don't have one, right? It's um, going to say $50. I mean, 50 might be there, but if we look at it, if in the end the permit fee itself is $50, 50 seems steep, right? And so 
I don't know whether we could recommend something without knowing what the permit issuance fee itself would be. Pam. Oh, I didn't take my hand down, sorry. I, so, I, I wouldn't mind having a nominal fee then because if there is in fact admin time required, then admin time is required. And we're trying to cover what it takes to run the program. Do we want to recommend a fee of 10 or $15 or do we just want to leave it up for finance? I think, I, would a little, say I think a little report to finance would be helpful that, you know, it should be nominal. I'll just put it in the comments. Does that work? <laughs> Any other questions related to fees? I guess my wondering is, are we ready to vote? A, a, I guess it's technically a recommendation. Um, I have draft language for it. Um, I gotta find it. Um, but Pam, you were raising your hand? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting structure, but Again, it, it it seems like we would we've talked a lot about the range of fees for here. And if we're gonna pass this along, it it would make sense to me to have some of our thoughts documented. And and I I'm not sure I am ready to plug numbers in, but it feels like we should be able to plug numbers in just as a starting discussion point. Well, I guess, I guess then let me, let me go back to this one. There's only two options. Does, and they actually estimate a wide difference in fees collected. Um, but is there an option that seems or or does someone, I, I can easily sit here and change one of these to different numbers if people want to see some different ones. We could potentially send this through looking different and saying, you know, of what were our schedule samples, CRC leans towards X. You know, we could, we could definitely say something like that. Um, or, you know, has no opinion between either option. If we want to put options out there, we could change these numbers or, you know, sort of lean towards one or the other. On this one, Rob and I were able to estimate that the cost to process all applications would be approximately 140,000 a year. At, at last time we did this with his answers, that may be different now, but. Um, so the, so meaning the, the, the numbers plugged into the option one really kind of cover the program. Uh, are much closer, but that that doesn't mean, you know, I, I gave a couple of different options here, right? Um, option two is a much larger permit, maximum permit fee. Option one is not. We could look at an option two. We could put in a different option two that's closer to 150 and see what it looks like. Um, you know, with an owner occupied parcel with an even lower base permit fee or something, you know, um, if someone wants to throw numbers out and tell me which option to throw them in, I'm happy to do so. Pam. I'm actually thinking that for all other parcels, I, I would, I would think that 125 is probably a minimum. So you would say for option one, Go to 125? Yeah. So again, these are these are oh yeah, these are different than inspection fees. This is not the inspection fee, this is just the application fee. Right. Okay, then I'm I'm sorry, then I would I would revert back to 100. Oh, and and one problem with 
with this, I, I will just say is you'll notice there are no parcels in in for our second option, the principal residence who owns no more than three. I had no way at this point of doing that because we just added that in and I don't have any estimates from Rob. So right now that number is basically a zero, which means depending on how many, they're all included in this number right now, the all other parcels. Right. So. Right. That's I why I asked John if it was possible to even figure out who who had you know three. I I can add to um, the report that finance would want Rob to estimate that that number of parcels. I'll make a note of that. Yeah, I'm actually fairly comfortable with the numbers 50, 75, and 100. With the $5 additional. Yeah, yeah I am too. So what, what I can note is um, I can note in the report that CRC is fairly comfortable with option one on the application fees. Um, and inspection fees, right now there are two options. Um, oh, here we go. I have two and a half FTE inspectors. I don't know, let, let me see what, um, see if I can find the document where Rob estimated how many inspectors he would need. So just since John's here, the I'm I'm guessing there's some overlap of duty. You're not just either processing application fees or inspecting. There may be a bit of of merging of responsibilities. Is that correct? Yes, currently um you know I also function as a billing inspector. So um, if if somebody's out on vacation or lately we've had someone out on vacation and somebody out sick, um, somebody still has to do those inspections every day. So, um, you know, that that happens and we get, you know, it's not unusual for us to have uh, 10 regular straight up building inspections to do a day. Mm. Um, they can be all over town. You know, you're down on Elf Hill Road and then you're up on Old Montague Road. And then in the afternoon, oh, you got to go down to Bay Road. So. So I found the document and Rob um, estimated a program cost of about $500,000. Um, And I'm trying to find the number of inspectors. So is that the combination of, of the estimated cost for the inspection program of 285 and then the cost of, of application so of 38? It was a total cost and he estimated three code enforcement officers, one lead and two non-lead code enforcement officers. So let me fix this number to three. So, and he said 475 or so as a total. And so that 340 plus 138 is about his total estimate. So, that was Rob's estimate a while ago. So as you can see, the total fees are well lower than the potential program estimate of 340 that I've put in these numbers. That sounds like dedicated inspectors for yes. this program too. This, yes. this isn't what the situation we were just describing where you know they they'd be able to go back and forth. 
Right. No, that was that was to implement this program specifically, not any of the other inspectors in the department doing other things or anything. So um, this is why we really need to send it to finance. But um... right. and this is why this is why when the question is asked, did these proposed bylaws get us what we want? If we're costing a lot of money to do something that doesn't get what we want, it's not a good expenditure of, you know, our time and and the town's money. Oh, there's no question in my mind that it takes more inspectors to get the benefit than what we have right now, because I have to do a daily triage. And, you know, that's the question about that property down on North Pleasant Street. How did they get, you know, how did they go without a, a rental permit? Because you know, I'm chasing a mattress on Taylor Street. Right. <clears throat> right. So the other variable on these options, you'll notice that the complaint inspections are much different. Um, Rob said in his in his response that they do approximately uh, that inspection services recorded an average of 300, 291 complaint response inspections during the last two pre-pandemic years. Um, and so the question becomes, how many complaint inspections will there be in a year? Potentially, once the program is up and running, there will be a whole lot less complaint inspections because they'll be regularly inspected. And so there won't be in need for as many, but we don't know. So that's why I put that one as a variable. Um, because four years from now we might see a whole a large decrease in the number of complaint inspections. But we may not, right? So we just don't know. <laughs> it's hard to <laughs> estimate, right? We yeah, may, but we may not. We still have our college students. Yeah. It's a new every year. New people. Yes, so that's why I showed the options show a different number there. Um, we can throw the numbers from below above to see oh wait, to see what that does. So if we pop the you know, 75 versus 30,000, it's a big difference, right? Um, but you know, if if we're aiming to try something that gets 350,000, We went into this knowing that we would need a more robust um, inspection force. Right. You know, even bumping the base fee up still only gets you to 240,000. Right. So this is why we really need to send it to. <clears throat> because we just don't know what needs to be covered under the fees. So thoughts on this document in particular or a, a motion to the council, are we okay with leaving this document sort of really up in the air in terms of, you know, we've, we've kind of said we like option one, it seems to cover the costs of the application part of the program and, and everything, but option two on the fees, we have no idea, right? <laughs> um, um, because it's just a there's just some big numbers you need to talk about and that needs more discussion. Are we comfortable with leaving that one sort of not necessarily covering what the costs might be? Jennifer. Well, <clears throat> you know, following on what Pam said, in our transmittal or narrative, if the point, the message is given to the finance committee that we want the program to be successful, that's the goal, not to have the smallest staff, <laughs> inspection staff that, what it takes to have this be successful is that's is what we want them to 
structure the fee schedule on. Okay. You know, I, I would also say myself in that transmittal that one thing we've struggled with is how much of the costs the fees should cover versus just the um, versus the operating budget. And and or um, um, strategic partnership agreements. Right, where wherever the funds come from. Yeah, type thing. Um, that that we've heard a lot of comments that that have said the renters and the property owners that rent should not be the only ones covering this program because it benefits the whole town, and so we felt finance was more. Um, at least I, I personally feel finance is better equipped to make those recommendations than we at CRC are in terms of the split as to what things are covered. Um, I agree. I agree. Just that they know we want the program to be successful. And I, however, yes, and that we don't want to do it on certainly on the backs of um, those who are just, you know, renting a couple of units. Yeah. So does this one at least look okay without us in the report talking about any potential preferred option for inspection fees? More of a just comments on what we want, what what our thoughts on just a fee structure in general are as it relates to inspection fees? I'm I guess I'm pretty okay with this. Okay. I'm going to stop the share. So the proposed motion is similar. It, it, it is last week's proposed motion. Um, I'm going to read it and we can talk about it before it's actually put on the floor. Um, so so the way I, it, I drafted it to say to recommend the council refer to the finance committee the document titled and then the document, it's gonna be a different document, but it said as modified at CRC um, for a recommendation. And that document was the fee schedule. Um, although I think I've added a different, an, and, and the document for the fee schedule as modified at CRC and the document titled, and this one would be the Excel spreadsheet, which is the fee schedule sample document. So the rental registration fee schedule and fee schedule sample. Um, um, for a recommendation. And, excuse on, me, and, and the, the rental permit breakdown data. Oh, those are in the documents. That rental permit breakdown data is part of the um, the fee schedule samples 2023. Let me let me get the the whole name of it. Oh, um, just like maybe I just printed it separately. Okay. Yeah, it it prints on a different page, but it is all it is four tabs in the same document. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, I just I just stapled them differently. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's four 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 tabs of the same document. So it would be those two documents. Um, I would also forward on, as I said, Rob Moore's answers to our questions because they're helpful for context. Um, those, those documents um, for a recommendation um, of the on the fees to charge under general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property with a report to town council by November 30th, 2023. So we're recommending that the council refer those documents to finance for them to recommend fees to charge under the bylaw and to get that recommendation to council by November 30, 2023. Um, we could change the date of the record when we would want it back from council. Um, you mean back from finance? Back from finance, sorry, back from finance to earlier. 
Um, we could make it September 30, we could make it October 30. November 30, I, I personally think is the latest we should make it because we want to be able to do this by the end of our term. So um, <laughs> October, October 30th. Jennifer, what's your thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree. That's um no, I'm just trying to see where CR the last CRC meeting. We have November 2nd. We want to get back to council, not CRC. Right. No, it would go back, it would go directly back to council. Council. So there's a council meeting on October 16th. And then <laughs> October 6th. I mean November 6th. The night before the election. Yeah. But yeah, there's not a council meeting on the 30th of October. So we could say November 6, we could say October 16. Do October 16. I mean, yeah, finance, I think so too. finance isn't that busy this time of year. Right. We could make it next week. <laughs> no, we couldn't. <laughs> I don't think they'll maybe that was given how we've struggled. I can't imagine they could do it in one meeting, but maybe they'll impress us. <laughs> um, okay, so now that we've talked about dates and all, I will read the formal motion unless people have suggestion changes to it before I read it. I'm trying to make it easy on our minute taker here. Um, okay. So I'm gonna move to recommend the town council refer to the finance committee. The document titled three rental registration fee schedule proposed revision five 2023-7-14. Is it 14? No, 7-28. Sorry, I didn't modify this. 7-28. Um, as modified at CRC. We didn't, yeah, we did modify that one. And the document titled three fee schedule samples 2023-7-28 permit data updated as modified at CRC for a recommendation on the fees to charge under general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property with a report to town council by October 16, 2023. Could I just get that motion one more time to make sure I got it down? Sure. Sorry for that. It's basically based on what was forwarded to you two weeks ago, Kelly, but it's a little different. Um, to recommend the town council refer to finance to the finance committee, the document titled three re rental registration fee schedule proposed revision five 2023-7-28 as modified at CRC and the document titled three fee schedule samples 2023-07-28 permit data updated as modified at CRC. For a recommendation on the fees to charge under general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property with a report to town council by October 28, 2023. Second, Rudy. Pam seconds. Any further discussion? Yeah, Pam. just logistically, if, if recommendations from finance come on these calls the 16th of October, um, then our documents will have already been displayed, presented, discussed by then, or is that the same date that, that the whole package would then show up? So the package is showing up this Monday for our first discussion at the council. Um, one of the reasons I've promised Athena anything that happens tonight, she'll have tonight. Um, and what I don't know is what the council will do. I presume they may choose to refer the the bylaw and regulations to GOL because our rules require GOL to review it for clarity, consistency, and actionability um, prior to any action or us waive that review. Um, so I presume on Monday there will be, I'm guessing there will be a discussion as to whether to waive that rule or to move to refer to GOL and a vote will happen on one of those two motions. Um, there's a chance that the council could potentially discuss whether to refer the bylaw and regulations to another committee like TSO, 
um, for a review and recommendation on the substance. Um, whether that would happen, I don't know. Um, that is not a motion that will be on the motion sheet because our motion was to recommend the council adopt. Um, but I don't know whether someone would make that motion or not. Um, since I think there is some thought that TSO would normally be the committee that would deal with these things, not CRC. So I don't know what will happen with that. It's being considered a first reading. The bylaw itself needs two readings. Um, I can't guess at this time when the bylaw would come back for a second reading. I think it depends on what happens on Monday. But if I had to guess at all, I would not expect it to come back on the 21st at the council meeting, because I think that one's pretty full, um, um, get, given other things that I've heard are on that one. I doubt Lynn will put something this big on that for a second reading. So I'm I'm guessing, but I haven't talked to Lynn that the earliest this would have a second reading um, is September sometime. What I don't know is, and, and presumably with our vote today on the referral to finance, that that motion will be taken up on Monday also to refer these documents to finance with the September, um, October 16th deadline. What I don't know is will the council decide to act on the bylaw and regulations before it adopts the fee? It, it could, it can't adopt the fees really, I mean, I guess it could, but it really shouldn't adopt the fees until the bylaw is adopted and effective or adopted at least, right? I don't know whether the council will decide to do all three at the same meeting or will choose to take the bylaw and regulations up prior to seeing a recommendation from finance on the fees. That's going to be up to the council. Did any of... <laughs> Did that all make sense? <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's not before we know it, it's the end of the year. Right. So, um, yeah. So any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll, I'll go to a vote. Um, Mandy is an aye. Uh, Pam. Aye. And Jennifer. Aye. That passes unanimously with two absent. Um, that means, let me go back to my agenda. Um, in theory, we are done with rental registration. Um, I want to thank John. I know Rob is not here, but John and Rob for 16 months of sticking with us through many different revisions, many different things we wanted to try, um, dealing with all of those questions, providing so many answers and so much other thing. You guys have been invaluable to us for all of that. And John, we might not see you. I, I'm not going to see you on the 17th. Some other committee members will. I won't be here on the 17th. Um, so we're going to miss you, John. You've been great service to the town. So, so will we see you on the 17th or is this goodbye? Uh, I don't uh, is just, there, is there need for me at that meeting? So the 17th, I, I was going to do what the next agenda preview is. I have put the, the agenda is posted. It has residential rental bylaw on it, just in case uh, I didn't know whether we were going to finish this and Athena goes on vacation tomorrow. So <laughs> I, we already posted the agenda, but um, I didn't know what happens on the 7th. So it'll be up to Pam to decide whether the committee needs to discuss rental registration after Monday night's meeting. I I might be able to touch base with you Tuesday morning, Pam, on, on that, but that's okay. that's it. Um, but, you know, I put it on just in case, you know, if the council's like, we're not sending it anywhere, we don't like any of this, send it back, right? Like, I hope they don't do that. But um, rental registration's on there sort of as a, as a fail safe for if something happens Monday night. Um, like, nuisance it's, bylaw. It's in, my, it's in my calendar, so. Yeah. No. Nuisance bylaw is the main thing on the agenda for the 17th. So I, John, you might, be it would might be very helpful if you could make that one for those yeah. conversations. I'll come to that one. That's sure. Thank you. Yeah. So That's that, a really key one, I think. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah, and, and that's where I suspect the committee will spend most of its time. Also on that agenda, which was on this one, um, and I'll touch base with you, Pam, on, on what the follow-up is, is the follow-up to our joint CRC AMAHT meeting that we had. There were three things CRC was supposed to be talking about. Um, so I just thought we'd, and I will give you those three things. I can say them right now. <laughs> they were discuss how we fit, um, how to fit into the manager goals um, some of these housing, affordable housing implementation things we had talked about, um, figure out some specific priorities to go along with that for the manager goals, um, surveying and outreach on what do people actually want for housing was one of the things we had talked about um, as being a CRC potential thing to do. And then um, uh, what about why are 29 to 49 year olds, why do, why would, would they want to live here? And if so, what investment would Amherst need to make that happen for that that set of group of people um, were the three things I had as sort of assigned to CRC for follow up discussion for that. So that is also on the agenda. Um, uh, Pam and I, we can touch base on what to focus on. But those are the things I don't at this point intend to change that agenda. Um, I don't think we need to put specialized stretch code back on at this time. I think we got the questions, we'll forward them on and that'll go to September. Um, so that's the agenda. Um, yeah, so any other agenda items that people would wanna see on that agenda? Okay, um, I don't have other announcements, minutes. Um, we'll try and do now. I know we're kind of running late. There was one change. Oh, yeah. So thank you, John. Enjoy your yeah. evening. Thank we're you. Gonna, I'm going to miss you. Yeah. So thank you for all your service. Be sorely missed. But we'll see you next meeting. Okay. We'll, we'll keep in touch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> feel free to come to public comment and make a public comment on occasion. <laughs> Yeah, I hope when Mandy said 16 months we've been working on this, I hope we didn't drive you to early retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Not early retirement. It is, yeah. <laughs> but gonna deserved, be, well deserved. I'm be 69. <laughs> I'm tired. You never know. <laughs> Minutes. We have two sets of minutes I'd like to get past. Um, Athena told me she was not sure who the abstention on the July, well, on, how does she word it? The, for the 7, 13, 23 minutes, there was missing who abstained in passing, I think it was those minutes. Um, but it was Councillor Balmill, and and it was that's who I thought it was. So that yeah. needs added to the minutes the identification of Councillor okay. Balmill, because I don't think it made it into the minutes itself for the July seventeen minutes. Okay, that's been corrected. Yeah, um, that was the only correction I had of note. Were there any other corrections for either of the minutes? I didn't see any. Okay, so I'll make the motion to adopt yep. the July 13, 2023 minutes as amended and the July 20th, 2023 minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Jennifer seconds. Any discussion? Uh, yep. We'll vote. Pam. Uh, it's an I. Jennifer. Yes. And Mandy is an I. That means we are ready to adjourn. I want to also thank, uh, we're a short committee today, a small committee today, but the entire committee for its work over 16 months on this. I don't think, uh, we were originally supposed to report in December. I knew it was a very tight deadline to get it there. I didn't think it would, it, I wasn't sure we'd make that, but I didn't think we'd still be here in August. Um, but the discussions were great. We needed to do it. And I think it's going to be a huge improvement for the town. And, yes, and thank you for steering us through this, both of Pam and our chair and our vice chair. When when this committee makes unanimous recommendations, it's always an achievement. So um, we were able to work through our differences to, to get there because we we definitely have them, but yeah. but I think it's an achievement for this entire committee to yeah. and I felt good having hearing John say he thinks that it's in a good place. Yeah. 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 And Athena, have a good vacation.
Well, yep. Thank so, you. And thank you, Kelly, for all your work. I don't know whether yeah. you'll cover our seventh, the August 17th meeting or not, but thank you. Oh, and I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> have, Kelly, have you yeah. moved? So we have our new place, but none of our stuff has arrived yet. So we're staying at my partner's parents' house for the time being. Excellent. Yeah. Good to have a place. <laughs> yeah. It's very nice staying here. Yeah. So, and with that, I'm going to officially adjourn the meeting at 6.42 p.m. Thank you for the extra time. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.